Welcome to iFab Online. Welcome to iFab Online. Welcome to iFab Online. Welcome to iFab Online. This is the Middle East Seminar. My name is Dale Cooper and I'm the moderator for today's event. Um, I'm currently based at the University of Manchester. I lead the global and transformational philanthropy team. Um, but previously I worked for the Queen Rania Foundation as Director of Communications and Strategic Partnerships. Um, before that I was at uh, King's College London where I looked after their Middle East relationships. Um, joining me on the panel today we have two fantastic speakers. Um, the first is Colin McCullum. Um, Colin is a Kearney partner with consulting firm Kearney and Company. And also joining us is Saeed Bashir, and Saeed is Director of Gift Administration at the American University. Uh, Colin, would you like to give us a little bit more background um, about, and your experience? Thanks, Dale. Um, as Dale said, I'm a partner with the fundraising and advancement consulting firm Kearney and Company uh, based in Scotland. And we work with leaders and professionals um, in a range of organizations really all over the world. Um, in education and culture and charities, but also in sports organizations increasingly. Um, I've been working in this field for about 35 years, which seems like a very long time now. And, and when I started here in the UK, I was the first alumni relations officer at the University of Edinburgh in 1985. And at that time, the profession was just emerging and there were only three full-time alumni officers in the whole of the UK. So I've seen a very dramatic change in the growth of philanthropy in education and culture, but also in the profession over the 35 or so years that I've been involved. But in periods of time, I was also a consultant and I am again now, um, working with leadership across the globe to help them build their programs. And so I've created programs and run programs and, and advised leaders on their work as well. Um, I'm thrilled to be a holder of the case Crystal Apple um, and I'm also something called a case laureate, which I'm, I'm told is, is quite a nice thing to be. Um, and in most of my fundraising roles over the last 30 years or so, 35 years, I've worked with donors and, and supporters in the Middle East. And my experience has mainly been in the Gulf region. Thank you, Colin. I've heard you speak at case events and uh, the case laureate um, title is definitely well deserved. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Said, over to you. Would you like to give us a little bit more on your background and experience? Yeah, it's definitely going to be a little compared to Colin. It's uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be amongst uh, you know some of my peers that have such great and vast experience. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, my name is Syed Bashir. I'm the director of uh, gift administration at American University. Uh, I recently joined this position like uh, literally two months ago. Um, and uh, prior to that, my experience has been uh, for about seven and a half years in the Middle East, uh, particularly with uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, a highly prestigious university out of Saudi Arabia. Um, prior to that, I've had uh, 10 years of uh, experience in the U.S. market, uh, primarily in the advancement services field um, and the gift administration uh, arena. The majority of my experience has been in advancement services with a good chunk of it on the fundraising side, uh, primarily in the Middle East sector. Speaking of case, as, as Colin talked about, um, had the pleasure and the honor of being part of the, uh, the debut case conference in the Middle East starting in 2018. Uh, and uh, although we haven't been given the case laureate award or, a, or, or an apple, uh, it definitely felt like being uh, you know, uh, honored and, and, and uh, privileged to be one of the pioneers uh, to start off in that region. Uh, with, the, with the case conference. So that's a little bit about myself. Uh, definitely passionate about, uh, you know, advancement services, gift services, development, fundraising with a total of 17 years, both uh, in the U.S. market and in international. Great. Thanks, Said. And we first met at the case conference in, in Dubai, and it was amazing just how international actually fundraising is in the Middle East. Um, Absolutely. It was good to see the, the representation. Um, thank you, everyone. Before we start with the first question, I thought it would be useful just very quickly to define the region because 
And the Middle East is not homogenous, just as Europe or North America is. And it covers a whole range of countries from Syria in the north, Iraq in the east, Saudi Arabia in, in the south. But I think for our purposes, uh, and just to be really clear at the top of um, our conversation, we're going to focus on the Gulf and the GCC states um, specifically. Saeed, as someone who's lived uh, and worked in the region, can you give us your view of the philanthropic landscape? Yes, you're absolutely right about, uh, you know, uh, a lot of changes happening in the, in the Middle East and the fundraising aspect of it. Uh, let's be honest, fundraising is a human concept. Uh, and, and as long as we have human beings, it's pretty much going to follow the same lines, right? Uh, and the same is for the Middle East and more particularly the GCC. Now, the differences obviously are just as many as any other country or any other culture would be. This is a very rich cultural area with, a, with lots of heritage uh, and lots of uh, you know, uh, social norms, nuances that you really have to understand. Um, and, and, and it's not something that you just pick up. Um, and, and one of the biggest, biggest advantages to this region, which can also be a disadvantage, is the fact that they're poised to change a lot of their, their ways and, and their uh, processes and adapt and progress. And, and that's definitely a great thing. Now, that being said, the, the, the region and the practice in that, in that particular region is, is so dynamic, sometimes it's hard to keep up. And, and so you don't have much of the standardization that we are privy to in the UK or the US or the Western world. Uh, so things are, are very fluid, very dynamic, um, and, and they're constantly changing. But that can be, like I said, it could be a good thing and a bad, and a bad thing. Uh, and I think it's, it's up to us to leverage that. If we come in uh, with the understanding or, or the, um, the concept that this is a stable market, then you're gonna get thrown off your game. You wanna understand that this is a, a new market, albeit very, very willing to accept all of these uh, new practices. There are definitely, uh, there's definitely a lot of potential in the region. Uh, not, not just from uh, the prospects or the donors, but from the practitioners as well. Uh, and as uh, Dale, as you mentioned, uh, as we have experienced in the case conferences over there, uh, it is unlike any other case conferences uh, that I've attended. Uh, you know, uh, they are definitely smaller. Uh, that's because by virtue of being a startup in that region, but the but the enthusiasm and the and the and the need to sort of adapt and learn and, uh, and, and acquire that knowledge, they're literally ready for that. And, and so the mode of acceptance or the rate of acceptance is higher over there. So that's something that you want to keep in mind as you approach the region. You know, the status quo that we are used to or, or the standards that we rely on, uh, it's a brand new playbook over there. Yes, you can use some of your, uh, how do I say this, you know, uh, the, the basic principles but you want to meld that uh, and you want to sort of adopt that into the local scene. Uh, you want to get an understanding of what is acceptable and how they are more receptive uh, to some of these, uh, you know, tried and true methods. Don't, don't accept uh, or, or don't anticipate that it will be accepted right away or it's going to be a perfect fit. Uh, it's more of a customized solution, if I can say that. Absolutely, thank you. And we'll definitely pick up in the course of the conversation um, about some of those new approaches. And, and what's really satisfying about working in, in the region um, is the willingness to think outside very defined philanthropic box. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly come on to that. Um, Colin, can I turn to you now? Um, can you give us your thoughts on fundraising from the region? Yes, um, I'll try to, and I, I, I feel already that we're, we're going to be coming back, as you said, to um, some core um, issues um, throughout this hour or so, um, which probably tells us something about where we think the region really is, but also some of the opportunities and the challenges facing everyone uh, who hopes to fundraise in, in the Gulf region. And I mean, building a little bit on, on what Saeed just said, I, I think that, that part of that um, evolution and growth um, should relate as well to how we build philanthropic cultures within our organizations if we're out with the Gulf hoping to raise money, um, but also organizations in that region, how they mature. Um, and so part of it is about building, a, building the cohort of professionals um, that you both talked about in, 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 in places like case conferences, etc. But it's also about 
um, bringing leadership um, closer to this activity in this space as well so that what we build over time is something that lasts from one generation of fundraisers to the next or one generation of leaders to another and when i observe my limited experience in, in that part of the world it feels a little bit like um it did those 35 years ago starting out on on, on this um, activity in the uk when we all thought it was mature and developed in the us um, and we were trying to adapt the best of that to the uk and we found that some things worked and some things didn't um, and i guess i was finding that in, in, in the gulf region as well but the difference is it's changing much more rapidly i think that's maybe what said was starting to hint at that that the rate of change is dramatic and, and one of the the issues around that is the use of technology um, and i found that as a uk based person i was almost having to catch up with the level of, of acceptance um, and comfort in the use of technology that exists in that part of the world and and i suppose that makes me think about the opportunities of the current time that we'll get to a little bit later in our conversation i think um, about um, the, the, the strange world we're now living in um, when we're all stuck in our, our, in our homes and having virtual conferences rather than real case conferences. The other thing I've found, and, and those of you who have lived there may be able to say a bit more, um, is about how giving um, is so deeply embedded um, in Islamic and Arab speaking cultures. Um, uh, as something that people talk about and, and, uh, and um, have an understanding of. Um, but then the issue is about how we translate that into giving to education or charity or charities or cultural organizations. And I guess the country that I look at, and I think the Middle East um, may now usurp that, was Australia and how quickly this culture evolved in the education sector in Australia. And part of that was related to the willingness of organizations and institutions to invest. And one of the points I'm going to keep coming back to in the next hour is the time this takes and the willingness of leadership to spend that time and allow that time for this to evolve and, and, and for them to invest in uh, building this up. And, and I observe that I think one of the, the reasons that Australia has, has moved so fast is that many presidents, vice chancellors have invested quite significantly in getting this stuff going. And you might say more willingly and faster than many UK universities did um, 25 years ago. I also think about the generosity of the rich and how important and impactful their giving is. But I'm also thinking increasingly about the demography, and I think I'll come back to this later as well, the demography in the Middle East. It's a young part of the world, and it's becoming a highly educated part of the world. That's growing very, very fast. So the young, educated middle class is a focus for real interest in the future. If they evolve as a philanthropically generous um, group, as is, hap is happening in other parts of the world, that could be very, very exciting for fundraising and the work that charities do everywhere, there and elsewhere. Another thing that interests me and has interested me when I've been working in the Middle East um, and actually pleases me because of some of my own personal interests is that concepts such as social enterprise, social investment and venture philanthropy are big news in the Middle East. Um, and I feel bigger than they are here in the UK. Um, and I wonder if that in some way is linked to this growth in a young, educated middle class. We know that young people are very interested and motivated by concepts such as social enterprise. That seems to be a great area that could be exciting for us all. And again, the other thing I've learned, if I've learned anything in the little I've worked on in this part of the world, and it's been said, and be, I'm sure we'll say it again and again and again, is the importance of relationships and networks. They really, really matter. But so does who asks. And so in, one of the things we're still learning in the UK is that, you know, some, I might be a fabulous fundraiser, but sometimes we'll get a bigger gift if the boss asks. The peer-to-peer -peer thing, you know, why do we keep thinking that billionaires will give to little people like me? and don't think that the chief executive, the president, the rector, the vice chancellor 
is just not willing to meet me and give me the time. So how we manage that in the Middle East is, I think, Saeed, you know best, I mean, deeply important that at the right time, if we're talking about a mega gift or a major gift, we must use our leadership strategically and wisely. And oftentimes they need to do the asking. But with a number of exceptions, I don't see that happening all over the place. With my consulting hat on, I see too many, many leaders who will not engage in this process. And, and if we believe in relationships and networks, then I think we need to crack that particular nut um, and learn to keep asking appropriately. And as I said earlier, I, th I, think, I think really the importance of technology um, is, is such a big issue in this part of the world and such a big opportunity. And I'm thinking particularly of a client that we're working with at the moment who recently carried out a virtual tele campaign very successfully in the current climate, raised the biggest amount of money they'd ever raised in one campaign. It's, it's the nuances of that region, it's, it, but above everything, the ability to be present, to build relationships of trust that last, and to keep them going. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. If you're not based there and you've got modest budgets and you've got big expectations amongst your leadership, uh, you need to try and manage that process. Okay, okay. If I can just sort of uh, add in a few thoughts on, on, on the lovely sort of uh, start that Colin has just basically energized this, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, uh, you're absolutely right on, on the generosity bit of it um, in, in the region. And if I can just sort of shed some light on that. In fact, I just want to sort of bring it all together um, and, and just uh, sum it up because, you know, the attention span of people on, on, on online conferences, as we all know, is very, very little. Uh, and I'm talking from my own experience. So uh, some of the, 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 the key points that you pointed out, Colin, absolutely key. Uh, absolutely relevant. Generosity in the region is very well known. They're a very hospitable culture. The demographics are very young. Uh, so you've got a lot of the younger generation that are involved, uh, that are part of the workforce, specifically in higher education, speci specifically in development fundraising. And uh, uh, absolutely, the, the, the affluent generation has, has a good chunk of it as well. You know, there's a, there's a lot of the demographics that are affluent, which is why there's so much emphasis and there's so much of, uh, you know, relevance in that region. Technology, you know, um, their, the rate of acceptance of technology is very high, much more than some of the other countries around the world. Um, and, and the final point I would, I would sort of make is to bring this all together you have to consider the impact that you're actually going to make. You know, as, as long as you can sort of uh, lay out the picture for the impact that you're going to bring, then all of these, all of these points that you just talked about will work in your favor. Uh, and, and I think the region is, is poised to make an impact, not just in the region, but in the whole world. Right. And so as long as we can show, because this being a brand new sort of industry and a concept, um, you know, not everybody is on board, but the minute we start to show and show real impact that we can bring about in that particular field, in that particular region and to that, the, the, the country, uh, and, and that's very important. You have to talk from a national perspective, not just very locally to that organization, how that ties up to uh, the national uh, vision of the country is absolutely key. Um, and this is this is common to all of the GCC countries. We... Side, I totally agree, and I, I think you, you've kind of stolen some of my um, comments under future questions. But but um, I totally agree that that you're absolutely right, and I've, I've learned this myself. Sometimes the hard way that we need to focus on significantly on the local plans and priorities of each country or region that we're talking to or talking about. Um, and be very focused on demonstrating impact. Um, and some of the clients that we work with are still struggling to think beyond the gift, if you like, to think about the stewardship. So the, the, the demonstration of the impact and then into the longer term. Um, and so that, that, I think you're right, that's deeply important in this particular part of the world.
Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a wonderful expression in Arabic, you know, the, the left hand should know what the right hand is doing, in, in terms of sort of being really discreet about your, your philanthropy. But, but my sense is that's really starting to change. And, and is that your experience too? You know, because donors want to know about their impact and, and by implication, their philanthropy is, is more talked about, more widely known. All right, uh, a stark difference, and, and you're absolutely right about the left hand uh, not knowing what the right hand gives. That's more, uh, has more connotations, religious connotations as well. So now we're talking about charitable giving. And so that's, that's one of the other, uh, you know, sort of obstacles that you have to get over when you approach a prospect or a, uh, a, a philanthropist, right? You've got to delineate yourself from the fact that this is not just charity work. Uh, this is philanthropic, you know, fundraising that you're talking about that is tied to real impact. Now, now I'm not saying the charitable work doesn't bring impact, but there's a confusion in the region that this is, uh, you know, akin to charity. Uh, and, 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 and there's already a, a defined sort of pathway for religious uh, charitable giving uh, called the zakat, uh, right? So this is uh, an entirely different sort of concept. Uh, so if you were to sort of go down that pathway and don't differentiate or make that distinction, then they'll just, uh, you'll just get sort of pigeonholed into the religious charitable giving. And so why are you doing all these extra, you know, the running around and the, and the prospecting and the stewarding, uh, not necessary. They'll tell you, we already have this. What you want to do is that, that, that sort of identify yourself as a different concept, which is being understood and is is now being adopted at a very uh, fast pace and i think that's uh, that's to do with impact so the where where you want to make an impact it's not necessary that your left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing that's that's more on the religious on the more you know humble modest giving side of things uh where they want to make an impact on 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 social causes this we're talking about you want to you want to talk about the impact that you would bring to perhaps the, 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 on the national level, uh, to the youth, to the future and the development of the country. Uh, and, and to the last point that I want to make, uh, that which, has, which has great emphasis, uh, is who should be asking. And, and, and Colin said it right, if you can't get the leadership involved, uh, then it's going to come at the detriment of this whole project or your approach. And I'll be very honest and frank about that. That's something that I have I've observed, I've experienced, and I've seen many, many, uh, you know, projects and proposals just fall through, uh, all, all because it wasn't planned perfectly with the right person in mind. Uh, if, if you're, it's, it's absolutely key and important to know your prospect and their professional affiliation and their title, and then to equally match that with someone from your organization. Even if you're the one who's, who's prospecting and, and doing all the running around, eventually there should be FaceTime with an equal uh, you know, uh, counterpart from your organization. If not, you're going you're, you're gonna to have a longer you know, sort of path. Uh, you're you're going to see your proposal or your project get stretched out indefinitely. Uh, it might even uh, you know, uh, uh, completely undermine your, your, your project. So, I would say who you, who's, who's asking, the final ask, uh, is absolutely key. And that, that nuance is very, very particular and very pronounced in the region. Yeah. I think I'm wondering, I'm wondering as you're speaking, Saeed, about um, the issue of charity versus whatever we call um, the thing that we're actually talking about. Um, and and may, may help some of our uh, delegates who are listening in to this conversation who are completely new to thinking about fundraising in the, the Gulf region, uh, that who might be a little bit mystified by what you said about what well, charity is about something religious or cultural, right. and we're now talking about something else. Um, and I think you're right. Uh, but in my experience, because I've been mainly looking at major gift um, or major donor fundraising when I've been working in this part of the world, so with, very much with individuals, um, perhaps alumni of a university who, who've been successful, for example, um, my conversations have never really fallen into that area of is this confusion with 
uh, my upbringing and my charitable giving to through for religious reasons or cultural reasons it, it always has been about impact actually and it's been about you know what together we might be able to achieve um, and so I, I'm trying to think that about this but I can't remember an instance where I felt this had to be done in a very humble quiet way um, indeed the major gifts that I'm thinking about and the donors that I'm thinking about have really wanted to be involved. The obvious example is um, where, where a donor in, in this part of the world may support a student exchange program uh, between the UK and a particular country in the Gulf or, or between or with scholarships or some kind of similar program. They really want to be involved with that. They want to meet the students. They want to be seen to be taking them around their country. They want to be having dinners with them. They really want, it's, it's very public. Um, so, and so maybe I, I tripped across that or didn't realize in the doing of all of that, that what was happening was what you're talking about, that there is a big difference between what we do for cultural and religious reasons and what we do for long-term business reasons or networking reasons or educational reasons or whatever. Right. When I first arrived at the Queen Rania Foundation, I, I was told that um, fundraising in the Middle East is, is not like in the UK and US at all. And when I asked the person who explained, of course, they, they what they talked about was approaches and processes that were very, very similar. But, you know, the, the need to focus on relationship building, um, on impact and, and on outcomes. Um, and, and as Saida said, actually, you know, the, the difference occurs in, in some very minor nuances, um, but those nuances um, are there. Um, yeah, well, well, and, and Colin, I will say that if you haven't stumbled upon it, that's another uh, specialty of the region. They're not going to tell you about it. Right. Uh, just out of, uh, out of respect. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's, just, uh, that's just part of the culture. Uh, yeah. They'll just quietly just back out, you know. Silence uh, is 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 another way of saying no <laughs> in certain, and they'll just you know just be indif indifferent. Uh, so um, people from outside, outside of the culture or from the region, will just be left you know uh, you know confounded. Um, and and so this is you have to pick up on this. And and one of the things that you that I have done is uh, been fortunate enough to work with the local uh, with with the with the local people. Uh, you know. Um, most of my uh, colleagues, in fact, all of my colleagues were Saudi. Um, and so I had, I had them to fall on and, and sort of uh, feed off of their cues. And, and, and obviously the, the, it's, it's, it's necessary to understand the lay of, la lay of the land, uh, but you can't pick this up in a book uh, or, or just watch a YouTube video or something. You have to immerse yourself in the culture. You, and, and I would say if it's, if it's not possible, perhaps for a quicker uh, sort of learning curve, I'd say get some of that younger generation involved in this. They're, they're definitely poised, hungry to be part of it. Why not use them, utilize their uh, knowledge of, of the particular culture, uh, and then at the same time, you're training them. Uh, you're, that's the thing that you're talking about, Colin, uh, you know, uh, bringing up this, 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 this concept and instilling that, uh, this concept in them. So that's uh, that's definitely uh, one of the reasons why you probably never picked it up. It's it's very subtle. Uh, it's yeah. not very outspoken. They they they're not going to tell you. They're just going to you know just turn around and just do what they've been doing. Uh, and that's uh, and you're right. The other thing is on an individual level, you might see people who are more interested in making an impact. I'm talking about when you approach individuals that are overseeing corporations. You know some of the big businessmen. Uh, they've had this institutionalized in their in their companies where it's just a given um, that the zakat is coming out of their companies and is supporting multiple uh, organizations, charitable organizations, institutions, schools, uh, um, charities, uh, whatever have you. So, you know, in the initial introduction, if you get pigeonholed into one of those, you're going to end up in that circle where you're having to deal with the uh, the CSR, perhaps. Uh, you know, people uh, that deal with all the religious, uh, the, the charitable giving. And you want to differentiate yourself and say, no, uh, we're here for something else. And that's where you have to, uh, you know, really identify, you know, how this is different, what you're trying to do is different from what is actually there. I pick up on, on two points. And the first one is for you, Colin, and then if I can come back to you, uh, side. So, so Colin, your experience of 
um, running alumni groups and, and has that been useful in, in terms of helping you map that local landscape? Some of the issues around um, engaging with alumni of a university, for example, in this part of the world um, is somewhat related to the fact that they are part of this young, educated, growing middle class um, in that part of the world. And so many alumni groups are largely made up um, of people who are very focused on their careers, very focused on their families, and they're very short of time, uh, very short of time. Um, and so holding events in this part of the world could be a significant challenge. Um, and people would have to have a very good reason to be motivated to come to an event. Um, and just because it's their university, having an alumni reunion is often not enough. I guess questions that we found alumni asking were, um, back to the networking thing, how does this help me build my network? How does this help me advance my career? So for the universities, it's quite an interesting issue in thinking more widely about the post-graduation service that a university provides to alumni anywhere. Certainly in this part of the world, we found that, that there had to be a benefit and an outcome. Um, and that could simply be an interesting network who could be, that could be helpful to me. Yeah, so in alumni engagement, um, it was very interesting. But again, the other thing I'll keep coming back to is that we very quickly learned that we needed to utilize technology much, much more than we did in the past. And so particularly in the current climate, um, some client organizations that we're working with have never been more engaged with their former students um, than they are now. And one of the interesting outcomes, which I'll come back to later as well, is that that has facilitated the greater engagement of leadership. Because we're not asking them to get on a plane um, and fly to Bahrain, we're saying, we need you on this Zoom call um, at this time for this reason, to engage with this small group or to engage with this individual. Um, and we'll give you the briefing to do that. And indeed, some of the leaders that we're talking to are saying that they have never been more engaged with the fundraising process than they are now. They have never had so many useful conversations, interesting conversations, by the way, um, with their friends and contacts in the Middle East, because they're able to be so much more effective and efficient with their time. Fundraisers have had to be so much slicker at briefing leaders to use their time effectively. Um, and one particular leader who we spoke to just about two or three weeks ago said that he really doesn't see himself traveling the world as much ever again because he's achieved so much through uh, technology. However, back to the point about who makes the ask and how, if you're asking for a big gift, you've got to be there. You've got to have a personal relationship with that person and make that ask on the ground. So we can do that more effectively. We're not just flying in once a year, having an alumni event and flying out again. And we still see a lot of that happening. And presidents and vice chancellors thinking that the world will change because they have done a tour of the world and they've been to Hong Kong, Singapore and, and Dubai on this year's trip. And, and, and that will somehow change the world. Do you know what it never did? And yeah. it certainly won't now. Yeah, I call it philanthropy tourism. And, and you're right. Like, tourism, yeah. It, it, it never worked and it never will. Yeah. Um, so um, not everyone who's going to tune into to this seminar um, will have the advantage of a, a large alumni base. So what are some of the, the practical um, solutions or, or ways through? Um, and I'm thinking about um, identifying somebody with influence, somebody with WASTA. Right, uh, a very contentious word, right? It's, so, it's something very uh, unspoken, but uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. If you don't have that alumni base to sort of fall back on, you definitely want to, you know, uh, hold on to what kind of impact that you're, 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 you're bringing to the table. First off, I mean, there's, there's definitely a reason why you're approaching this prospect. Um, and, and there's got to be a connection. You've got to establish that connection. Almost, you want to justify this. You, you want to rationalize this connection and, and make that prospect see how they can be involved in the success of your program, your project, or whatever have you. Nine out of 10 times, that's very easy to do. Uh, but the most difficult part is to convey that message and convince the, the, the prospect uh, of the outlook or the vision that you're seeing. 
Um, so that I would say definitely, you know, leverage your existing relationships. I mean, if you happen to know another prospect or a, an existing donor that has a, a network uh, or a relationship with your your prospect, then you leverage that. Uh, or um, as Colin and I were talking about, you know, get your head honcho on that visit uh, and, and that'll definitely catch their attention, uh, regardless of what it is. You know, take the, the, the key person and then take a very attractive proposal, which they can clearly see the impact on. And that's gonna, you know, solidify your pathway and open doors. And you've got their, their attention at this point. Once you get their attention, then it's, it's up to you to sort of make that ask and, and sort of get to that path. Uh, but yeah, to your point, if you don't have the alumni sort of base to fall back on, then I would say go back to your existing relationships, do your prospect researching uh, to identify existing, you know, affiliations, associations perhaps, uh, and, and the ex uh, existing network. Your experience say, do you, do you find that, or do you think that in that kind of situation where you're having to build a prospect pool or a donor base, um, one of the helpful um, uh, uh, issues or trends in this part of the world that I think I've observed is the relative interest of the media in some of the stories and activities that our organizations, if we're out with this region, um, are, are about. Um, I think what I'm trying to say in a rather roundabout way is that I've been surprised by the amount of media coverage that we have secured for some of the things that we've been doing or saying in the Middle East, much more than we find in the UK. You know, in the UK, we always feel that if, it's, if you're not royalty, then no, nothing is good news. It's all about bad news. Um, but in the Middle East, there seems to be quite a lot of interest in the media in some of the things that our organizations are doing. So we, we seem to be able to build some kind of profile in, in this part of the world relatively more easily than we find in the UK. But maybe I'm wrong, that may just be a perception. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and that goes to the points that we were making. Uh, this region is poised to make an impact in the world on a global scale. And with the young demographics that we talked about, that we all know, uh, you know, impact and the change is happening at a very rapid pace. And, and, and this is, this is the, the in thing right now. Uh, change, uh, how they're making an impact to the future generations, and, and what kind of transformation is, is, is coming about in their countries, uh, in the economy, in the population. You know, these things uh, are really hitting, you know, sort of that mark where obviously everybody is paying attention to it and, and subsequently the media is picking this up. And that's why you'll see that. So uh, the educational sector um, and they, not so much, you know, uh, from an economic point of view, but from an impact point of view. You know, from uh, transforming their uh, their their civilization or or their 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 cultural uh, norms uh, because of the the rate of acceptance. That's that's something that everybody's involved with, and coupled with you know the explosion of social media right now, uh, you know that's 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 just fueling all of this. So any change anywhere, any impact that you can sort of uh, be part of. You can you can guarantee that media is definitely going to be on the heels of that, uh, yeah. and so yeah, it is it is a lot easier to get on on uh, the media sort of circuit, uh, which is surprising, right? But that's because uh, of the rapid transformation that's happening in that region. Yeah, I think some of the most exciting approaches to philanthropy are coming out of the region and and are being created and and, and distributed. So you know, venture philanthropy or or um, blended philanthropy. Um, you know, social enterprise, um, particularly in that global melting pot that, that is Dubai, there's some really exciting trends and ideas. And, and I think uh, it, it helps as fundraisers to, to approach it with a very open mind. I mean, fundraising in any region of the world comes with its challenges, uh, and the Middle East is, is no exception. Um, 
And one of the things I always found difficult to try and figure out was, was the decision making process. You know, you've, you've um, made the ask, you know, pitched it exactly right. You have a wonderful um, proposal book and kind of working out how decisions are made within, um, w within the Middle East culture uh, was always kind of something of a mystery. Sorry, I, I don't know, what's your experience or what's your insider knowledge? I think you're right in the sense that this is a difficult part of our process, uh, the decision making and, and you know, who, who gets to decide, right? Who actually makes the final decision? If we knew the answer to that, we'd probably be somewhere else, right? Uh, there is no easy answer to that as well, even in that region. In fact, it probably is a little more complex because, you see, it, it, with our experience, we know who to anticipate uh, and how to anticipate their next steps based on, you know, experience and, and and, and understanding the cultural norms. Now add to that the complexity of the fact that there are social norms and cultural norms that are unique to this region. And then the fact that this is, is sort of new, uh, this concept is new. So we're kind of left, uh, you know, walking in the dark, you know, feeling our way through it. And, and that's pretty much been my experience. Every organization, every prospect has been different. Um, you, can, you can generally sort of, understand you know who the decision maker is but you'd be surprised sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it's it's not just the person but maybe it's uh, a myriad of reasons it could be the person who's who you have taken for the ask um, for better or for worse uh, and it could be the organization it could be the project itself um, or the time uh, timing is, is something that I definitely want to sort of emphasize. What with all the the, the changes that are happening, you know, uh, and and the the, the the transformation, and uh, the you know the, the particularly the pandemic that we're going through right now, it has thrown a bit of a curveball. Uh, it, it is kind of unexpected, you know. Economies are are taking a hit. Uh, people are more more uncertain about you know what or how they should be making their investments and so on and so forth with their philanthropic investments as well. So the uncertainty that is that is sort of rampant around the world is now adding to that uncertainty on the decision making as well. It's sort of creeping in there. So uh, I say it's a mixed bag right now, especially with the pandemic. I'd say it, you want to be even more in tune with your prospect. You want to you want to communicate more, and you've got to build that relationship, and that's the only way you can sort of decipher this. At this point, you know, uh, there's nothing, there's no trick that you can sort of fall back on, and you just literally because at, if you're at the stage where you're you're ready to make that ask or you have made that ask, and you're just waiting for that final decision, you've got to get in touch with them. You've got to have their pulse. And then just tweak that program or whatever it is necessary to get them to agree to it. Uh, and the best way to do that is to, you know, go straight to the, uh, to, the to the prospect. Yeah. The, the other thing that I um, found really helpful is also building the relationships with those around the prospects, and particularly in, in the Middle East, those advisors or, or you know, um, the senior people, whether it's in a, a company, because often the process is quite consultative. Um, before a final decision lands with with the the key prospect or the person at the top. And Colin, um, what are the the major challenges that you found working in this region, and how did you navigate them? I, I think we've touched on a number of them. Um, I guess one of the biggest being, as a, a small organisation, particularly in in the UK, for example, just trying to carve out the budget and the time to be present in another country and particularly one like this where uh, networks and relationships matter so much and to avoid that fundraising tourism, whatever you called it, Dale, earlier on, uh, tendency that, that still exists too often. But if I'm trying to think of something that we haven't said so far or talked about so far, I guess it would be around the issue of transparency, uh, the issue of scrutiny that we're all under increasingly for around the source of money and around what the money is meant to do. So um, thinking around some of the conversations I've had with prospects at this stage, I suppose, and those around them, as you're saying, Dale, um, around all of that, and then explaining to the leadership back home, particularly those who are maybe on volunteer boards, uh, about who this is, 
what the source of the funding is and what we've agreed to do. Um, and back to something that we talked about earlier about is this charity and do I understand what that means in the UK and what does that mean in the Middle East or is it something else? Is it that blended thing you were talking about, Dale, or is it out and out sponsorship? So, you know, the, the prospect wants something in return. And in the UK, we tend to be very clear about when a gift is tax deductible and when money is not. Um, so we kind of know what is charity or philanthropy and we know what is sponsorship or, or something else, in social investment or whatever else it is. The time it's taken sometimes in some of the conversations and negotiations I've had around getting that gift agreement right. So the gift agreement was always a great tool. Um, and for anyone in our audience today who isn't already using gift agreements wherever they're fundraising, particularly for larger amounts, they need to start doing that because we're under more scrutiny everywhere, not just in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and all of this in my mind is related to some very well documented in the media and elsewhere uh, problems in the UK with very large gifts from this part of the world, where because things changed over time, uh, things started to unravel. And indeed, as those of us based in the UK may remember, some university leaders had to resign. Some fundraising leaders had to resign when things went wrong based on a very big gift from this part of the world. Um, what wasn't perhaps in place, as well as it might have been and would be now, would be some kind of internal process, a, a gift acceptance policy, a gift acceptance process that would have meant this wasn't just a fundraiser doing a deal, if you like, for shorthand with someone in the Middle East. But there was a process by which the institution, the charity, the university, the, the, the theater, the ballet company could look at who this is, what the funding's for, what the organization is being asked to do and make a decision about whether it's appropriate, whether um, it could eventually lead to a reputational damage to the organization or not potentially, uh, but also what the money is meant to achieve. And that's a very helpful conversation anyway, because it means that in our organizations, we're talking about giving more, talking about the nature of giving much more. And those nuances that Sides talked about, we're talking about this not just within our development fundraising offices but we're talking about them strategically um, across an organization and that's healthy for the future but it has led to us sometimes turning gifts down yeah. either because there has been a mismatch between the the donor the prospects um, at requirements and needs uh, and or the needs or or the risk averseness or, or the hunger of the organization and, and that makes me remember that really that's a lot of our job as fundraisers. We, we need to understand, as sai has been saying as well, we need to understand the passions and needs and wants of a donor audience, a prospect audience, and the needs and, and the, the vision and the future of our organization. And we have to bring these things closer together and work in that space where they overlap. And part of that is due diligence. Part of that is being very open and clear about this. We're not hiding anything, we can't do that. Um, and uh, doing the scrutiny that we should do on both sides so that we have an understanding that's mutual. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the live issue in the region as well. And, and having worked for a, a foundation um, in the Middle East, we came under a huge amount of uh, media scrutiny, but also uh, government scrutiny to account for our funds and, and where they came from and, and how they were spent. Uh, and there was a uh, you know, move to, uh, to be really and fully transparent. Saeed, is there anything that you want to add from, from your perspective? I do. I just sort of want to bring it together with, uh, with what Colin is talking about. And I'm thinking, you know, listening to Colin, I'm thinking about, you know, if I were a delegate, you know, listening to this, what how do I how do how do I maneuver this? How do I maneuver these waters? Right? Yes, transparency, good thing, absolutely. Um, and and uh, I would say, you know, uh, to start off, you must have that that inbuilt in your system. Due diligence, absolutely. Yes, we should have a gift acceptance committee of sorts that oversees all of this. But how do you you know um, do your due, due diligence? 
uh, when your prospect research team is 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 at a loss in researching this prospect or this donor, you know, with the lack of information, you, you don't have that kind of information that we are privy to in the US and UK, we can't dig up information uh, uh, or that level of information on, on prospects. It's a, it's a big, big a question mark and something that I've struggled with uh, myself. You know, finding information on a prospect, literally next to nothing online, right? So how do you do, do your due, due, due diligence, you know? And uh, how do you make sure that this is the right one? You don't want to get into it and then sort of get, you know, caught uh, with, with holding the bag. So uh, the, the answer to that, and, and, and just so the delegates can understand this, is, uh, is, is basically go to the source. You've got to have that relationship with your prospect. Spend enough time, you know, know your prospect. I know in this time we can't invite them over. That's one of the things that we definitely cannot replace, by the way, Colin. Yes, fundraising, uh, you know, over on, online virtually definitely has its plus points. But one thing it doesn't take the place for is to get involved, get that prospect involved in your organization, in your institution, bring them over, having them see the impact of your organization or, uh, you know, having them see something real in brick and mortar. Um, that's just, I, I don't know what's a replacement for that, but that's a different conversation, right? So I would say establish that relationship, get to know your prospect, and in time you will definitely know enough about you know, their background. And, and once you've spent enough time, you'd automatically do your due diligence to know if this is a prospect worth pursuing, you know, um, eventually it will come out. And if it doesn't, hey, um, you know, uh, that's why you have your gift acceptance committee. Uh, and that's why you have these policies in place. And, and that's why you're transparent because you did everything across the board and, uh, and uh, along the path in learning this prospect and getting them engaged and for whatever reason you never saw whatever this red flag was and if you've done your due diligence and you still end up at that point then there's nobody to fault at right um so i would say that heavily invest in your prospect research team do your research but then, you know, there is a limitation to the research that you can do and then fall back on that relationship. So between your research and your relationship, that's the way to make sure that you don't run into some of those red flags and, and, and those embarrassing situations where the institution or the organization has to walk back. Yeah, Saeed, so, you know, when we're working with clients, we, we so often say the best prospect research you'll ever do is talking to a prospect. So, you know, you're absolutely right. That's the same right around the world get out there and talk to people um, and as you're saying we, we, we know fundraising is a process or a process it's not a light switch it is going to take time and it has steps so a, along those steps of the the cultivation cycle you're going to be doing your due diligence yes through the networking you do through talking to people who know people um, through looking at other giving behaviors this person has made in the past other gifts they made in the past or whatever it might be um, and that takes us to the point of, of one of our internal challenges um, about trying to help our leadership understand why it's going to take as long as it takes in this right. part of the world um, that we can't just there can't be this assumption that the, the middle east is a wealthy part of the world therefore we can fly in and grab a a six figure seven figure gift and fly back um so all of this is connected again back to that issue of relationship building and managing those relationships great Absolutely. we're almost coming to time um but we have time for one last question so I, I have a great affection for the region and have made many lasting friendships and, and it's absolutely true what they say about our hospitality you know it's generous it's warm and it's plentiful so this is your, your opportunity to offer some final thoughts to our audience on um, fundraising from the Middle East and, uh, and to sell fundraising in the Middle East. I think we've said it all really. I think the opportunities are, are absolutely there. Um, I think that standing out is that need to understand where prospects, potential supporters actually are um, and what those local plans are. Because if we're thinking particularly at the high level, that a lot of giving is around helping to further the national plans of a particular country. We need to see where the overlap is with um, our priorities and vision and what we can deliver um, as, as well as what their needs are. I think in the modern, in the current 
world, in the current reality, um, we have a huge opportunity in the Middle East. As we've said repeatedly, this is a region that is young and growing. This is a region that is becoming more and more accepting of philanthropy and fundraising. Um, this is a region which is very tech savvy. Um, and this is a region which will respond positively to the current reality of much relationship building happening online. So we need to make use of that opportunity as fundraisers out with the region in engaging with the Middle East. And we must keep asking. I'm working with organizations who are doing more asking than they've ever done before. And I'm working with organizations who have stopped asking because they think it's inappropriate. If it's not about COVID, we can't ask. Wrong. Keep asking. You may not be asking for money, but the asking process builds a relationship. You might be asking for time, for advice, for comment, for support, for whatever it might be. But keep that asking discipline. Get an outcome from every engagement. Um, and the other piece I did want to just touch on at the end like, was back to something we spoke about early on. This is a region that's growing its philanthropic infrastructure, but there are not enough fundraisers. There's not enough professional expertise that's sticking with it, that is staying there. And I'm struck, if I think back over my 35 years, about the impact that in the UK, the case fundraising training program has had. You know, and, and having taught on the, one of the big teaching programs in the, in the UK, the Spring Institute, in educational fundraising. I've been stunned by the growing number of bright young people who have chosen fundraising as their ideal career. I never chose fundraising. I fell into it by accident. It happens to become an entire career. And here we are, I'm a case laureate. But for young people today, increasingly, the brightest, like in, often in North America, right, are choosing fundraising as a legitimate and honorable career. We must encourage that in the Middle East. Thank you. Syed, over to you. No, absolutely. Uh, very key points. And, and yeah, uh, here from the case laureate, th these are gold <laughs> work. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, you're, you're right. And, and to sort of sum it all up for all the delegates that are you know, tuning in to listen to this, um, you know, if you're, if you're walking away with a vague understanding of this region, I will say this, there is more potential in this region than there are challenges. Uh, and, and it's how you maneuver that. I think it gets more challenging if you were to bring your existing playbook and try to I I implement that and expect immediate results. Like as you said, Colin, just fly in, get your six figures and go back. No, that's not gonna work. You've got to invest time. You've got to establish your, your base over there. You've got to spend time with your prospect. You've got to know your prospect and you will definitely, definitely reap the benefits. You know, define the impact, understand what the country or on a national level, what they're aiming for, because that's exactly where the entire uh, population is focused on. You know, that's where the people are uh, driving themselves to. They are working on, on a national level. These are smaller countries, obviously, they can do that, uh, and which is why it makes a difference, you know. Um, all through the GCC, they've got their, their impact, national impact plans. You know, understand that and try to align, align your programs with that. Invest time in, in establishing a base over there. If, you're, if you can, I know we can't make any visits right now, but invest time out virtually then, you know. Uh, eventually, when this is lifted, um, that, that way you still have that relationship, relationship to fall back on and continue, you know, growing that relationship. And, and lastly, if I could say, um, do your research, you know, absolutely do your research before you get into it. Uh, not just your research on your prospect, but the research about the country that you're going to be working on, the program that you're going to be working on, and the vision that, that, that uh, all the people are focused on. If you bring all this together, I guarantee you there is there's going to be more success than the challenges, and you'll totally forget about it. And I think we, Colin, Dale, and myself are, are testament to that, that we have worked in this region, have, have, have uh, only good things to say because there definitely is. Challenges are there all, all around the world. Where isn't it uh, challenging, right? But it's, um, uh, it's about understanding your challenges, and uh, uh, it, it definitely will be rewarding. Great. Thank you. Thank you to you both for your time, your expertise, and your knowledge. 
uh, and thank you to our guests for tuning in and uh, we look forward to joining you in the Q&A.